we should always love people, you know. We should always love them and we should really get out of just wanting to satisfy ourselves only, you know. We have to take care of ourselves, we have to take care, we have to feed ourselves and stuff like that. But I think we always have to think about love for humanity, you know, to help out people and stuff, you know. Um, I think that's really important. Hawaii의 평화로운 주말 아침. 숲과 나무의 향이 가득한 곳에 왔습니다. 하와이 하면 누구나 바다를 먼저 떠올리는데요. 바다가 하와이 풍경의 전부가 아니라는 사실을 일깨워 주는 곳입니다. 저기 보이는 산이 코올라우 마운틴이에요. 정말 아름답죠? 저 산맥의 영향인 것 같은데 여기 비가 정말 자주 내려서 어, 공기 중에 어떤 이런 싱그러운 향이 배어 있어요. 호놀룰루 시가 운영하는 다섯 충목원 가운데 최대 규모인 이곳은 오아우섬 카네오에라는 동네에 위치해 있습니다. 호오말루히야 발음하기도 힘든 이 수목원의 이름은 하와이 말로 평화와 고요를 의미합니다. 머리가 복잡할 때면 저는 이곳에 와서 자주 숨을 고르곤 합니다. 하지만 오늘은 다른 이유가 있어서 왔습니다. 하와이 한인 이민 선조들의 목소리를 만나는 시간. 무지개 나라의 유산 그첫 번째 주인공은 작가 게리 박입니다. 한인 3세인 게리 박 작가는 현대 하와이 아시아 문학 대표 작가로 하와이 대학에서 영문학을 가르쳤습니다. 또 다큐멘터리 감독이기도 하며 인권 운동가로서 다양한 활동에 참여하고 있습니다. 아무 a t h i r d generation Korean American. I'm a local person, I guess, because I was born and raised in the islands. Um, my grandparents all came from the northern part, northern provinces in Korea. The joy, of course, my, my life, you know, is, is my family, you know, my, my, and then my three kids, and then also I have two grandchildren. You know, and I love them, and they're the most, they're my most favorite people in the world. I'm sure you having Korean grandparents. kind of help you or formed you become a writer is that is that right so i was pretty much raised by only my maternal grandmother what was her name you said im uh, oksun yeah. so that's your mom's side my mom's uh, mother she used to tell us all these stories you know um, she spoke korean of course and then broken english and i spoke mostly english and broken korean <laughs> <laughs> and, and somehow we communicated and she would tell me stories about growing up in Korea and, and these kinds of things and her, her rendition of, uh, of Korean history and stuff and so I got those ideas and I never, um, I never visited Korea until the first time I visited was 2002 in August um, I, was, um, I was awarded a, a Fulbright and so I went to a Korea University and I, I spent the semester there and it was the first time to be in Korea you know, land of my ancestors, and every day was a learning experience. I would just walk the, the alleys, you know, the komok, and just walk and walk, and every little thing, smells, uh, every visual, um, everything was, was stimulating me. And so I just, um, um, I, I, I took a diary, I, I was keeping a daily di um, a diary at that time. I put together a, um, a collection of essays about my, um, 
uh, my impressions as a third generation Korean, you know, going to Korea, going to the, uh, my ancestral homeland and just experiencing um, what I could experience. Was there any like a emotional or sentimental uh, moment that you were while you were in Korea? Oh, I had I had many emotional sentiments actually. You know. If you could share one of them. One time I was I hiked, I think Slorak Sun, you know, and there was a little shrine up in the top, and it was foggy, you know, and um, and I went to the shrine um, and at the very top of the summit, and all of a sudden. I had all these images of my my maternal grandma, my way harmony, and I just broke down. I don't know, I just started crying. You know, I was like, that's one of the, I guess one of the most emotional kind of times I've ever had. Um, and like I said, I, I'm not gonna write about it. You know, I'm, I'm saying this right now on camera and, and to you and stuff like that. Is it because you're, you're, you feel like you're not ready yet or like you will get too um, emotionally attached to the... It's just that I, 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 if I'm, if I was to try to write about this, I don't think I'll be accurate, you know, because I, I, I just couldn't write enough, you know, uh, write it in a depth that I, that I should, you know. Um, um, it's like, you know, for example, can you explain what Han is? You know, Han is this kind of historical thing that I knew my grandmother felt. You know, she had a lot of um, hardships in her life. Um, she's from uh, Kyungido and her parents, she was orphaned when she was four years old. And her parents, my great-grandparents, um, they were executed by the Japanese. Um, the story is that they were, you know, teachers, they were educated, and um, I guess the media spoke out against that time. This is, this is when the, the, before the annexation, um, and they were, they were um, the story is that they were executed, they were, they were killed by the, the Japanese. Um, the soldiers and stuff, and so she was an orphan at four years old, uh, and so she was raised in a Christian um, orphanage, uh, and then she was, when she was, I think, 16 or 17, I, I know she came to uh, Hawaii when she was 18, um, she became a picture bride, and, you know, if she never met my grandfather, and she doesn't know anything about that, and, and she had no real, as a woman, as, as a female in Korea, especially if you're an orphan, you know, you have no, you know, uh, status, nothing, you know, you uh, so she came, um, that was her only option, you know, um, and of course then she, you know, she was my grandfather, she raised 12 children, and tons of grandchildren, um, and so I just felt, you know, and then also understanding Korean history and stuff, and uh, I just felt a real, you know, tightness, you know, when, when I, and I, I, somehow I just had these, and on top of uh, Soroksana, I just had these images of, of my grand, grandmother, my, my maternal grandma, my way um, And I just broke down. And so it was, that's one of the, I guess one of the most emotional kind of times I've ever had. I think the bottom line was just that the kind of love they gave, you know, she gave me, you know, um, and the trust and, um, and just the, the grandparents, the sacrifice. And, I, you know, that, that's almost like a well, too worn, phrase of how grandparents they sacrifice and stuff and but they did you know when i met my sister for the first time you know, i have a half sister in korea first time you know um, and the, the phrase that she told me was uh, you know of course korean they have this word sarang you know love but she said you know there's a deeper love she told me you know and you know in her korean and i was trying to, and it's sojung you know sojung he you know this preciousness this deeper love you know uh, that you have, um, um, and I feel, and I feel this, you know, it's, and I think it's something that um, my grandparents, you know, shared with me. Being born and raised in Hawaii, it is hard not to be affected by the breeding of the land and sea. I grew up in a household that nurtured me on Korean, Asian, Hawaiian, and American values all at the same time. Today, the Academy might say that this is an example of the multicultural hybridity that is inherent in American, perhaps global, culture. I never saw it that way. And even now, it is hard for me to define the way I was brought up if I'm to describe it in contemporary academic terms. It was sound as if my life was culturally separated, divided into disparate, perhaps disruptive, factions. Better simply stated, my culture is what it is, a product of the many crisscrossings 
of various cultures in Hawaii, a working out of the differences and similarities between the indigenous culture and the many others that invaded or were introduced here. So I wrote this because, you know, you had these questions about identity and I think identity is, you know, sometimes it's kind of a rigid kind of a way of looking at things. I think a better way to look at for myself, and what I'm trying to explain here is that I have many identities, mm. if you want to call it identities. And I, I just like to think that this is just the way it is. In a few words, can you say what was the, the Plantation Children about? Plantation Children was a project I did, an oral history project. Um, and what it is was I interviewed um, 20 plus second generation Koreans in Hawaii. Um, I asked them questions about their lives and stuff and a lot of these people were, were just everyday people, you know, and uh, with the hope that, of preserving their history of um, growing up in a, on a plantation. A lot of them were raised on a plantation. They had Korean parents who came, came from Korea, from the old country, and just um, wanted to preserve their history so that the next generations uh, could understand that, could, could really feel that, that that's part of their history too. You know? A lot of oral histories, you know, that we have, so-called oral histories and stuff, right, in history books, yeah, they're written about, you know, the rich people, you know, people in power, you know, politicians, this and that kind of thing. And they don't really talk about the, the common people, the everyday people. And it's really the everyday people that are bringing up in the base of society, right? You know, they're the ones who do a lot of work and stuff, you know? Um, and so it's so important for us to understand, you know, their lives. Um, and their lives are really interesting. <laughs> and also, going to the next um, subject, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Park, the, the you know, anti-Asian hate, hate crime is increasing nowadays, um, sadly. And like, what should I tell my kids? You know, when we watch the news, there's a, this anti-Asian um, hate crime. I think, you know, for one thing, it's always been here. You know, right now it's been popularized and stuff like that. Um, I think one of the things to try to defeat this um, and it's an ongoing thing, this kind of, this, this kind of racism, this kind of, uh, this really bad, you know, air, you know, uh, when people start doing stuff like that, is to understand history, to understand what, what happened in the past. And they want to kind of promote, oh, you're different than me, and, you know, and therefore you should be treated differently and stuff like that. I think that we got to come to a point where, yeah, we are different, that's great, you know, you know let's, uh, appreciate our differences, religion, you know, gender, uh, sexual orientation, whatever it is, you know, that kind of thing. Um, otherwise, this anti-Asian, anti-black, anti-whatever, anti-transsexual, uh, anti-this, anti-anti-anti is going to continue to go on um, uh, until we, we really deal with it on, on the level of, uh, you know, what, what is this about, you know? And, and do you um, believe there's something that liter literature can do about that? I think culture is such an important part, you know. Um, as, as a retired professor, <laughs> I gotta say this, that a lot of students don't like to read now, you know, I think they like, to, you know, they play with their phones and stuff, and you know? maybe I'm prejudiced like that, but I think uh, cultural aspects are really important, you know, film, for example, is really a big thing, music and stuff, and I think literature does, you know, you need that written word to uh, to write a script, to make a film, or uh, you need the lyrics for a song and stuff like that. I think culture is such a powerful thing right now, you know, uh, to, to, so we can create um, this good public opinion, this education and stuff uh, to transform the world, to change it. You know, I wanted to ask you if there's like a words of wisdom that you want to pass it on to the next generation, what would that be? I remember growing up um, and I could go to any one of my cousin's house or uncles and aunties again like I could just sit down there and we can eat you know and eat to our heart's content you know and I think that's the, um, um, the whole thing of food and love that's a really important thing what if you don't have a family you know some people yeah. are not fortunate enough to have a good family when you're born or when you grow up what 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 would you say to those people well I think that um, we should always 
love people, you know. We should always love them and we should really get out of just wanting to satisfy ourselves only, you know. We have to take care of ourselves, we have to take care, we have to feed ourselves and stuff like that. But I think we always have to think about the love for humanity, you know, to help out people and stuff, you know. Um, I think that's really important. I agree. And like by reading your um, short stories and what you do with Kukua Hawaii or Plantation Children, I could see that, you know, the fundamental ideas that you have, you know, loving other people and golden rule, basically. Thank you so much for um, sharing your ideas and all that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> When my first son was born, I remember coming home and looking, you know, going, going to bed. My wife was in the hospital with, uh, with the son and all of a sudden I said, wow, I'm a father and I got this responsibility. And I just thought about that. I just thought that it was such an important thing that um, um, because for me it was a struggle to you know, feel when I was growing up, you know, is this really my culture or is this that and so on like that. And, um, and so I wanted to create stories that, you know, he, that not only he, but also, like I say, his later siblings and also his friends and so on, the next generations and such, um, to be able to see that, 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 you know, these stories are their own, that his own and their own, um, that they could be happy and proud of and such, you know. And, I'm not saying that my stories are going to be exactly that, but at least set the stage for it, or at least be part of it, contribute to uh, this ongoing creation, synthesis of a new culture that would um, help to, you know, help people to envision another way of looking at things in the world. So here's another section I like in the preface um, to my book, uh, The Language of the Geckos and Other Stories. There are so many positive stories to be told about life in Hawaii. So many stories and traditions of Hawaii that are not being recorded. Now I am determined to write stories that will not only reach out to my son, but also to create stories that will be a part of a culture that he can claim as rightfully his. Something that no one can take away from him, that no one can usurp from him and thus deny his existence to be to be proud, to be his own. So I began writing my stories, stories that he can call his own, stories that his future siblings and hopefully his friends can call theirs. I want him to be given the opportunity to grow intellectually, physically, culturally, sexually, socially, and perhaps most importantly, spiritually, as much as possible on his own terms. You know, when you know that your son or the future generation is going to read your stories, like what do you try to deliver through your stories? I hope that my, my stories uh, can be enjoyed by, by people um, and they, they can be entertained. Um, and they, they call, you know, hopefully, as I think all writers, artists, musicians, um, they hope that their work is, is a source of inspiration that people can inspire. That, that, that is, on the bottom line, they just enjoy it. And I think that if that happens, I'll be happy. I'll be very happy. Um, I think that if they can find more meaning from it, you know, from a, 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 a meaning that's going to help to um, uh, help them understand the world better, perhaps, well, even better yet. 